Welcome to Friday's edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 337, the fall edition. I'm Gavin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and it's the 27th of October. Okay, I don't know if you guys know this, but Gavin is not in some secret Russian bunker in a cabin hidden away in the uh, former Soviet Union uh, filming a Michael Caine film. Uh, you, this is your chapel, and we are looking at the back wall with a cross over your shoulder. Um, describe a little bit your, your chapel there. Well, Kevin, it's a it's a very elegant garden shed. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, it's, it's a king of garden sheds. And um, uh, my wife, knowing I needed a chapel, made the supreme sacrifice of, 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 of turning it over to me. So, in fact, uh, it has an altar and some icons uh, and, in fact, a, a very sweet smell and a very sweet atmosphere. Um, and then when I'm not saying my prayers in it, I turn around 90 degrees and I use it as a broadcasting studio to the world for That's Anglican good. TV. <laughs> That's good. Well, so gone is the garden hose, the the hole, the shovel, and all the, the tools, <laughs> and you've, you've, you've retaken a, a shack for Christ, and we appreciate that. You know, it's, it's it's we've moved from from the from the, the Garden of Eden to the to the Kingdom of Heaven. <laughs> uh, now here in uh, Connecticut, my studio, uh, it is clearly leaf season. I have uh, about uh, 12 people w walking through our little condo uh, complex here with leaf blowers. And uh, apparently every time oh. I press record, they come running for me over here to, to, <laughs> yeah. to sound off their complaints. So if you hear leaf we blowers, I apologize. Uh, if you hear Mrs. Asherton going, honey, dinner time, <laughs> it's because it's about uh, almost 6.30 over, or 6 o'clock over. It's almost almost in a time <laughs> oh boy so we, we we need to hurry up uh there's lots of news coming from england there's a little bit of follow-up uh with the gq interview that justin did um but i want to talk to you about felix first um specifically ugh, i can't even talk it's friday specifically there was a student who gave his opinion at the university and his opinion did not meet the uh, the mindset of the university and he was kicked out not for having an opinion the university says you're allowed to have an opinion you're just not allowed to express an opinion now i'm not really sure and up on england's uh freedom of speech laws here in the constitution of the united states uh we have an amendment that says you have freedom of press freedom of speech and freedom of religion and uh, it's in our bill of rights what kind of freedoms do you have for speech and other things other than the Magna Carta? Well, you've hit the nail on the head. We have the Magna Carta. All our freedoms have evolved from the ground up through mm -hmm. common law. Uh, and uh, they have, we've been the cradle of democracy. And everything about our Christian culture in England has, um, has, has been uh, it's set within a context of freedom of speech, which we've exported to the rest of the world. One of the strange things that's happened over the last 10 years is that we've, uh, governments have passed legislation. So if you like from, instead of growing up through the common law, the, from the bottom up, from the top down. Well, this, this is indeed exactly how the law of England is made, but the legislation they've passed is to inhibit free speech. And we, we're at, at a very serious point where um, in the case of Felix Nagoli, um, he does have the right to free speech, but he doesn't have the right to exercise free speech and not be kicked out of a university. So he has his right, he can use it, but he can still get kicked off a university course for using his free speech. Well, let, let's back up a little. Uh, a couple years ago, Felix was in a Facebook discussion and gave his opinion that said, the Bible and God condemn uh, homosexual or same-sex relationships and he defended that with scripture uh, for some reason somebody went back and looked at all his posts from years ago found this and said aha we have something on Felix let's take it to the administration and the, the administration uh, for some reason said that Felix did nothing wrong he holds no greater bias against uh, 
uh, people who are in a same-sex relationship. He wants to be a social worker. He would probably be a good social worker. Uh, they defend him at every mark, and then they kick him out. Well, it's worse than that, Kevin. The, the, the critical feature you've left out is that the professor in charge of the committee that examined him was uh, was and is a famous LGBT activist. Mm -hmm. So uh, she's a committed, uh, highly committed to the whole LGBT issue. And uh, she didn't declare this, but um, but it was one of the reasons why she wanted him expelled from the course. So the the the, the other issue is that when Felix was um, contributing to the Facebook discussion, it was outside the university context. It had nothing to do with his studies, nothing to do with the University of Sheffield itself. It was completely independent. So somebody else joined the dots. And the, the problem, the, in reading the judgment in the High Court, so this has gone quite quite high up the English legal system. It's gone right to the High Court in London. And it was clear that the judge felt very uncomfortable with the judgment he had to come to. But effectively he said that there is not a law at the moment on the statute books which protects Felix and allows him to exercise his free speech and defends him against the university throwing him off the course. Effectively, the university said, uh, if we're going to train him to be a social worker, his views, should they become known, will make it difficult for him to retain the confidence of some parts of, of the community. Uh, and that's that's our reason for, for kicking him off. If you like, it's a kind of uh, it's a kind of professional judgment, a house rule amongst social workers. Uh, you can see how they might choose to preference 1.8% of the population uh, over the rest. But, but then the judge said there's just there's nothing to stop them doing that. So although he has a right to free speech, he must pay the price for exercising it, which is a destroyed career. Well, I was heartened, and I know you were heartened by this as well, as all the bishops in the Church of England gathered together to protest this ruling uh, oh, wait. Okay, the Church of England has said nothing. I take it. Well, this is this this is a strange thing. It, again, it seems to be people's complete inability to build up the dots. <clears throat> as you as you look at the way in which, in the public sphere, uh, organisations like Christian Concern uh, uh, put a great deal of legal resources into defending Christians who are disadvantaged, fired, and effectively persecuted. Uh, for expressing their faith in the public space. And time and time again, the courts say, um, we have no means of defending you. The laws in this country, the equality laws, are so stacked against you as Christians uh, that that's one of the reasons why you're brought here. So we're fighting effectively a losing battle with, with the help of, of, of marvellous lawyers and, and, and generous donors. It, you know, the battle's being fought, that's for sure. But it's a losing battle. And what is so incredible is that the bishops of the Church of England, from, from Justin Welby down to the to the diocesan synod at, at Hereford, mm -hmm. cannot see that by putting their weight behind uh, LGBT issues, they are in fact closing the door on their own Christian fingers. That this 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 movement for um, sexual parity, yeah, the parity of sexual identity, uh, has the effect of silencing Christians who want simply to maintain faithfulness to the biblical tradition. It, it's like the church is cutting its own hand off and it can't see that it's doing it. Well, it does because it it wants to use free speech as, as well. Before I move on to that, this is your chance to stop, take a break, go get tea or coffee, whatever you uh, want. Sit down again, click like. It's your chance to donate to uh, Anglican Unscripted. I know that Gavin and George like the likes. I like the likes too. Also, and you guys aren't doing this yet, I, lots of people like the program. It's time to share the program. Y you need to man up or collar up. <laughs> You need to collar up and, and share the program with your congregation, with your friends, maybe your bishop, if you're a bishop, your archbishop, um, and, and let people know that you watch and they should probably watch too. On to Hereford. They like free speech as well, Gavin. This was such a very odd thing to do, Kevin. I'm not sure where, where the greater disappointment lies. There's so much of it. Uh, the, the disappointment lies in a number of things. First of all, uh, this motion to, uh, to, to, to try and get General Synod to provide liturgies to bless same-sex couples runs in the face of what the House of Bishops agreed. 
So we have we have conflict at the center of the house. Jesus said, "A house uh, that um, is divided against itself cannot stand." And we have the ungainly um, sight of two bishops, both of whom are supposed to be guardians of the faith: the diocesan bishop and the suffragan bishop, standing against each other, saying. God wants two entirely different things. The diocesan bishop said God wants justice for gays. They love each other so much, we must bless them in his name. And the suffragan bishop said the Bible is very clear about what God wants from our sexual orientation. We cannot bless what God wants to heal. Uh, and the, um, so the, 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 the synodical debate itself was profoundly ungainly. And I think a, a microcosm of the Church of England. Here we have uh, bishops and clergy set against each other with two entirely opposite ideas of what God wants. Well, this must mean they have two different gods. Um, you cannot present <laughs> these two different ideas without saying, look, we're serving two different kinds of God here. One of the gods wants uh, to pat us on the head and say, uh, you fall in love and, and, and sleep with people you want to and, and be blessed and be happy. And the other one says, you know, your human condition needs sorting out. Come to me, I will forgive you and mend you. Uh, these are two entirely different human projects and they exist in the Church of England. And the really frightening thing is, uh, not only that bishops and priests are set against and lay people are set against each other, but that the progressives, the ones who believe in the God who pats you on the head and says, do what you want to be happy, uh, they won hands down. And, and so the, the question is, this will come to General Synod, but we already know from, if you like, the test run last summer, um, we had these two rather silly debates and we, number of us, jumped up and down and said the Conservatives have not done very well uh, in holding their position. This bodes badly for the future. You know, if, if something really serious comes in the future, <laughs> the chances of holding the biblical line in the Church of England are much diminished. Well, now we know what's going to come. Something This will be presented to the business committee who will decide whether or not General Synod gets to take up the cudgels on behalf of the progressives in the Hereford Diocese. The, the, the church is divided against itself. Uh, it's unlikely it will be able to stand. It, it brings an interesting question. And, you know, watching the Church of England has any synod in the last 60 years not made the church more liberal? And I can't think of it one where they said, ooh, we've gone too far, let's take a step back. Um, and, and you're right, the, the fight is over whether God is an affirming God or a transforming God. And uh, the New Testament God I read about transforms, uh, and it certainly has done so in my life. Um, any other news over in... England way? Well, I think you know, I think we should tie this in to the Church of England statistics because, as it happens, they have just released the, their their health check for the last five We're years. We're not going to use the word health. <laughs> nope. <laughs> and, um, and, and what we what we there are some ty there are some small pieces of good news. Uh, the Church of England has welcomed uh, new members. Mm -hmm. they, they, that's true, and the numbers are down there. Uh, the, the bad news is that at the very best. Uh, dioceses like Norwich and London have just about held their own. London's grown 1.1% over five years. But the bad news is as you go down the list, you find that as you go down to, uh, to, to Durham and Chichester, their losses are at 8%. Down to uh, Bath and Wells, they're 10 And uh, uh, Chester and Manchester and Sutherland Nottingham, they're down nearly 14%. 13.9. Uh, we talked last week about Rochester. How's Rochester doing? Uh, Rochester is, uh, let me see if I can find it with my one skitting yeah, eye. Say, why are we having <laughs> you read the statistics? I have two it's, okay eyes. I could probably be reading them. <laughs> uh, I'm just looking to find it and I can't see it. Starts I don't believe it's R done terribly well. Oh, right, there we are. Minus okay. eight. Okay, minus, minus eight. eight. Okay, and so, um, you know, uh, talking about the, the, the liberal change, um, we can't just blame liberalism on this, but um, is this church worth fighting for? And clearly the parishioners uh, are, are fleeing the sinking ship. Well, there's some more information we need to know. First, first of all, what we don't know um, and is the extent to which the progressives and the accommodationists, the people who worship the, the happy God, the God mm -hmm. who wants you just to be happy, whether or not they are um, de decaying as fast as we think they are. Because the anecdotal evidence is that people who believe in the transforming God 
are converting people and growing, and those who believe in the, uh, you know, the, the, the nice God are, are not. We don't have that. We don't have firm figures of that, but we think they, we think so. The other issues are that um, baptisms, uh, weddings, and funerals are down between 15 to 28 percent. So funerals are down nearly a third. That means um, you're living longer. Uh, well, over well there. the implications that are. <laughs> Um, the implications that are enormous, particularly because when I was a parish priest, uh, I remember thinking that that I needed three hits to get people into church and converted. Um, you know, two baptisms and a funeral, two funerals and a wedding. Um, but but within one family, give me three hits, uh, and and we usually manage to draw them in. That's good. Now, if you if you don't have access to people through these what we call the occasional offices, then the gap between people who know nothing about Christianity and the ministry of the church. Uh, is made is made very large. We know too that the four thousand that's about a third of the of the four thousand smaller churches have congregations of twelve people in them. Um, that's like a kind of Bible study group. Mm -hmm. uh, and that but the, the average congregation is about um, fifty people out of a pool of seventy. So two thir only two thirds only ever come on a Sunday. The Church of England has made a great deal of its weekday ministry, saying, well, we're losing people on Sundays, but we're picking them up at other times. But the real problem is the demographic time bomb. The average age in the Church of England is between uh, 65 and 70. So we can play with these figures as much as we like as they slowly decline. But somewhere between five and, and 10 years time, the majority of people are going to die and just disappear. Um, well, and, and so the, 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 you know, the, the point at which the dropping graph line goes down through zero uh, is, is the interesting point. I talked, uh, I think, three or four years ago to an uh, Englishman named Gerald uh, uh, Bray. And I, talking about the Church of England, he goes, you know, Americans think about Anglicanism much differently than Englishmen do. Uh, for us, it's the Church of England and the churches around us are no different than a public library. We go there when we need something. Um, it's not um, the the end all uh, evangelical Anglo Catholic uh, three streams tool that you guys think it is. For us, it's just part of our society, and um, you guys make more out of it than we make out of it. And I think that's reflected also in the numbers. It's true, but I mean, in a sense, Gerald, Gerald Bray, whom I, whom I know and respect, is out of date. Mm -hmm. That's what did happen. Okay. Um, they, they don't even come anymore because there is no need for it. Right. And the, I mean, the, other, the other crazy thing is that for church leaders to present a God who simply wants to act as a kind of divine therapist and pat people on the head. I mean, there is just, you know, there is so much therapy out there. They don't need to come to church for therapy. They need to come to church to be saved from hell and saved from themselves and to save a dying world. And only if church leaders are willing to tell the truth about the gospel is that is there the remotest chance that people might hear what they need to find Jesus for. But at the moment, that's not happening. The future, the future quite clearly is that the Church of England will collapse under its own weight within quite a short period of time. And I'm not saying that because uh, I have any sour grapes. I've spent the whole of my life uh, trying to play my part in, in being an agent of renewal and faithfulness. Um, but the future, we, we're going to have to plan for a different future. And the future, I think, will be a sort of a kind of underground church, uh, fellowships of people who um, very much like Dreyer suggested in the Benedict Option, find that they have to keep out of the public eye to some extent to avoid being legal targets, um, but, but build up a faithful community of people uh, um, ju just out of sight. Now, the Church of England uh, needs to find some kind of strategy other than just to hit the wall and to kind of crash as its fuel runs out in seven years' time. I, this is going to seem odd after the last 200 years in the Church of England, but you may want to try the New Testament. <laughs> Romans 12, be transformed. It doesn't say be affirmed. You know, stuff like that. But um, we have come to the end of our program at 19 minutes so on a wonderful Friday. Um, people are going to want a health update. How's the eye? Uh, Kevin, it's, it's, it's great. It's, okay. it's really getting better very quickly. Um, the the, uh, the the headaches could improve and they will improve. 
Um, but before long, we'll drop the eye patch, and I'll seem slightly more normal than I present at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so your headaches won't be the eye; they'll still be the Church of England. Getting back to the normal pattern of things. Exactly Thank you so. so much. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashenden. You've been listening to episode 327 of Anglican Unscripted. Have a blessed weekend. Add 10 to that. that this is 337. God bless. Oh, uh, <laughs> <It's all right. laughs> I thought I was doing so well. You were doing great. <laughs>